And at the heart of that plan are two goals that are near and dear to our hearts in terms of what we're trying to achieve for student success, with literacy being one and uh, successful transitions being uh, the second one. And both goals really work in parallel with each other in terms of complementing the work that we're doing within our classrooms and in our schools to have students be successful in our district. Uh, surrounding that is our purpose and our vision as a district. And on one side, you see the structures that support the work that we're doing with our school action plans, our strategic plan, and our growth plans that our principals and vice principals are utilizing at their schools to uh, support their action plans. So those three structures work collectively together to support our, our uh, district goals. And on the left side of the uh, framework of learning, you see the uh, the things, the, the ideas that we're drilling down in terms of our professional learning with our principals and vice principals around assessment, uh, having productive conversations as a team and getting into classrooms and supporting our staff within those classrooms uh, to support the work we're doing with students, uh, creating a sense of belonging for all our students in our buildings and our staff in our buildings to make sure that we are successful with creating change, which is on the far left of the uh, learning plan and those eight elements of success really are our vehicle for driving change through the whole learning plan to ensure that we're capturing each of the components successfully. So when you uh, look at our literacy goal, uh, students will be reading at grade level or to their individual IEP or AIEP goals by the time they transition out of the primary program. For us, that's K through three. Uh, the target is increasing the number of students reading at grade level or their IEP or AIEP goals to 80% by the time they transition out of the primary program. And as you think about the primary program, we want to also make sure that we're thinking that, yes, K-3 to is important, but we recognize that this really is a K-12 to uh, initiative that we're looking at, and that just if a student isn't successful by the end of grade three, we continue to look at structures and strategies we're using uh, to ensure that student is successful by the time uh, they transition out of our schools. So for this presentation, there are three main learning intentions that we would like to share with you. And as we go through the presentation, for you to uh, make your reflections on our goal in terms of literacy and these specific learning intentions that we're working through with our principals and vice principals and our staff within our schools to be successful. We recognize that learning in our schools takes patience and time. So when you think about a literacy goal, we are on a journey together for this to be successful. We recognize that learning is embedded in memory, history, and story. So as we go forth and we go through this journey of uh, increasing the literacy results in our schools, we have to learn through the things, the stories that we're learning for our students and our staff, and honor those to look forth in terms of what's next. And then learning involves recognizing the, the consequences of one's actions. So the actions that we are uh, utilizing in our schools to move literacy forward what are those actions actually creating for our students in a successful way? And look at the things that are having the greatest amount of impact for our students to be successful. And as you know, those learning intentions come from the first people's principles of learning. So with that, I want to draw you into specific reading strategies that we use to increase our students' ability to think about thinking or metacognition. There are five strategies that we use within our classrooms and some of our classrooms across the district. And these strategies uh, are produced or have been created through the work of Adrian Gear. And when you make connections, you make emotional connections to text, text yourself, text the world, or text the text. So uh, the first strategy we try to teach in our classrooms around uh, comprehension or metacognition is making those connections and building the emotional connections to text. The wondering is about asking those questions and engage your brain in asking questions as you're going through a story. What sort of questions are you asking yourself and how deep are those questions in terms of engaging your brain into the text? When you visualize, you build pictures. So you take the words and you make those into pictures in your mind and that creates a pathway of visual cues for you as you read the text. When you infer, you think beyond just what the text is and you look, read between the lines to figure out what is going on actually in the story to have a higher level of thinking around what the story's meaning is. And then finally, as you pick up a book and you read it, you're transformed by the information within that uh, text, whether it be fiction or nonfiction, and it creates new ideas and new opportunities for you. So as we go through the presentation tonight and you think about the learning intentions we have, 
uh, what we want to be able to do is to draw you into each one of those strategies so that you are making strong connections, you're visualizing what's going on with our action plans for learning around literacy, you're asking questions about what we're doing to make impact, you're inferring the, uh, the information we're going to provide tonight around data to see what's really behind the lines and how we're drilling it down, and hopefully by the end of the pre presentation you'll have some new ideas and new opportunities for us as a team. So the first connection I want you to think about is reading us to the mind what exercises the body. So if we think about our core beliefs around literacy in our classrooms, we're now seeing this, um, we're now seeing this in display in our schools, that we are noticing within our schools that reading is what we do every day in our classrooms. And that's a huge celebration and a huge um, uh, compliment to the work that our teachers, our support staff, and our principals and vice principals are doing to be intentional about reading. And uh, Trustee Ross would have a strong connection to this uh, uh, quote because he is the, 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 the trustee that makes sure that during those times where we have some break times, we're really exercising our brain by reading some good texts and good stories. And then you'd also know, notice that what we're trying to do with our literacy goal, yes, 80% by the end of the primary program, but what we're trying to create is we're trying to create a joyful experience in literacy. We want to make sure that we are moving our students in a way that they recognize that if they have the skills to be successful in reading, they will go to independence in literacy and have a joyful experience and have a lifelong uh, learning experience around literacy. And then finally, we connect to the idea that we are all teachers of reading. So K through 12, so all of our, uh, all of our educators in the system have a connection to literacy. We all know how important it is, and we all value it, and we all bring it to our professional responsibilities each day. And we teach reading no matter what grade level, no matter what subject. It's a part of who we are and what we do. And what we found is that at first, in our district, those core beliefs that we had and the connections we made, we weren't really aligned in terms of what was going on. We weren't unified yet in what was going on because we had not made the learning visible. We had not really had the intentionality of the conversations in our buildings around literacy. We just thought it was happening. And we made assumptions, we made judgments at times that this was going on. And what we needed to do is just bring that learning to the front and center of what we do, make it visible, talk about it, have conversations about it, engage all our professionals in the conversation so the pockets become a system that is aligned and unified in what we do. And that's what we're seeing now with our action plans for learning. We're going to a place of being unified, having shared beliefs around what we think uh, reading instruction should look like in our classrooms, and creating experiences for students that will be uh, a lifelong for them. And with that, we wonder. <laughs> So lots of wondering going on and, and thinking about what are the strategies that we can work on with teachers um, that they can then pass on and work with students in terms of uh, quality literacy instruction and what other things can we do. So always wondering about that and also thinking about, as we're wondering, thinking about that lens of the eight elements of success that we've used uh, in order to build our action plans for learning in our schools. So we're trying to take that as a district and use that in some of the work that we're doing um, and looking at uh, some of our strategies through this lens. So I've spoken quite a few times about um, our balanced literacy uh, plan, so I'm not going to go dig into it too deeply. but. When we think about the vision um, through the eight elements of success, we think about our balanced literacy guides. They really are our guides um, to quality literacy instruction. Um, they are not prescriptive, but they definitely are evidence-based, um, and they really give something that uh, teachers can hang their hat on in terms of their literacy instruction. The team that we have uh, is our district support team, and that, those, that is um, our instructional services team, our district teachers. Uh, as well as learning support services, and as well as the admin that um, have that, that are, are here at the district, that we are all working together to try to make sure that this goal is highly intentional and, and in the forefront, as Woody said all the time. Our community, our PACs are involved in our um, literacy goal, and when I think about community support, um, 
you know, we've been building community support in all kinds of different ways. One of the things that comes to, my, to mind is just around the IDEA Summit and how we use community members as mentors um, for students. So we're starting to build that piece of the work that we're doing and that's really aligned with the redesign curriculum. When we think about measurement, um, we think about the work that we're doing in terms of reading assessments. And when I talk about reading assessments, I'm not talking just about um, the numbers at the end of the day. Those reading assessments that we are doing right now in K to 8, and is the expectation now that we're doing, is targeting instruction. Because how do we know where our learners are if we don't have some sort of assessment of them so that we can target the instruction? Um, so we have done a lot of work around this. This is probably one of the most exciting things for me right now is to see this happening and see it making a difference. And when I work with teachers and when we're working alongside them doing assessments and then they're surprised by things that happen or things that they find out from that, it re reminds me how important it is to do this 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 work. This work is one of the most important things that we can do, this formative assessment piece where we're really looking at what is it that our learners know, what is it that is challenging for them still, and how are we going to target our instruction um, to those students. When we look through the lens of student learning, I want to give you just an example. There's lots of um, strategies that we've been using around student learning, but one of them we use um, now is a program called Word Works Daily. So the reason that we moved to this program this is a kindergarten reading readiness program. What we were hearing from grade one teachers is that the kindergarten students coming into grade one were just not at a level where they could then get them to the level they needed to get them to by the end of the year to get them at um, meeting reading level expectations. And so we needed to do a little bit more intentional work there. We, we also have kindergarten teachers that haven't, they're, they're not as qualified as they might have been in the past. They've, they've jumped into that. They maybe don't have the early childhood education piece in it. So <clears throat> we found this program. It was actually an American program. We worked with the author of the program to Canadianize it, to Langleyize it. And it's now being used in almost all of our kindergarten classes. So we are seeing a difference. We just implemented it last year. We did in-service with kindergarten teachers. They are loving this program. It is still, it's not a drill and kill program. It is daily routines that they're doing with kindergarten kids around phonological and phonemic awareness. Um, and that is, those are the reading readiness skills that those students need to have as they enter um, grade one. We are really excited about that. We implemented it in a lot of kindergarten classes last year, in more so this year, and we're already hearing a difference from the grade one teachers in terms of that reading readiness. So I'm really excited to see what happens by the end of this year with our grade one students. Um, professional learning, one of the things that I, I always feel like uh, is that we need different voices around the table at times and sometimes um, you know you, you, you get tired of hearing the same old voice and we bring in some fantastic literacy experts and we brought um, them in every, uh, every year. Uh, a new voice, um, a voice that's uh, recognized as an expert in literacy instruction um, and our teachers really appreciate that. Uh, environmental design, uh, one of the things, and I think uh, Mal has already handed out a couple of, of examples for you. Here's an example of something where, we're, again, we're just trying to lay some foundation um, and bring some clarity to some strategies. So looking at um, the universal strategy, strategies that you use in your classroom uh, in different ways, uh, so it helps us uh, to think about what other strategies might we use when we have students that are challenged by the learning. So you're going to see that beautiful little guide that's just been published that's going out to all teachers and it's another Langley, a Langley piece. That's the one. Yes, it is fantastic. Um, and that really came from um, all of the district, the district support team getting together and saying what are the strategies that would help all of our learners. And then finally, just in terms of financial sustainability, um, Things like that guide where we're taking the time to create it so it's a cost, but it's a cost that's not going to be a reoccurring cost. These are anchor documents that are going to help our district to anchor us in what is evidence-based um, quality teaching and learning around instructional practice that we can continue to use for year after year after year rather than trying to purchase new things every year.
So you might be wondering about, uh, from the systems level, if we have the eight elements of uh, success and we go through that, what actually trickles down into the schools and what artifacts and evidence are we seeing that actually are showing impact in our schools? So each of our schools align their action plans around the eight elements. And so at the systems level, if we have our own eight elements in terms of what we're doing, what do we see that's noticing uh, at the school level that are people that are doing that are having success? And both Mal and I get the uh, pleasure of going to visit principals and vice principals and have conversations specifically about the action plans. And we ask specific questions that drill down the thinking around the eight elements of success, specifically around their school goal, which uh, is literacy. So if you visualize, what does this success look like? So when you think about the artifacts, Woody, what artifacts are you sharing or what artifacts are you seeing in the field that are actually demonstrating the eight elements being implemented within our schools? One thing we notice is there is an alignment and collective ideas around the vision for literacy. So we have in our schools, we have our, our, our teachers and our support staff and our principals and vice principals building actions around a collective vision. So uh, these statements, these sorts of ideas are creating the environment for people to dig in and have a sense of belonging in terms of where we're going with literacy and what we want to be able to achieve so that every child every day gets important pieces of literacy for them to be successful. So what might some of those things look like? So when you drill a little bit deeper down, that might be strategies like daily read-alouds, listening to a flu uh, fluent reader, read to yourself daily for joy, regular small group instruction and ongoing assessments, reading instruction daily, specifically like metacognition strategies around making connections, asking questions, making inferences, and our students having those tools in their toolkit to be able to comprehend text. Access to high interest books at reading readers levels. So in our classrooms, if you go into our classrooms, you'll notice that there are areas set up that specifically speak to literacy that invite students into those spaces to enjoy books by themselves or with a buddy or with a teacher and really feel the enjoyment of literacy. <laughs> Writing instruction and activity every day, personal and meaningful. So again, when you think about how do you activate how do you engage students to access the curriculum so that they feel their sense of belonging within that curriculum? It comes from themselves. It comes from meaning and purpose and why they're doing what they're doing and how it supports them as a learner. And then, of course, across our district, we have our learning commons, and our learning commons are a hub for literacy. And our learning commons teachers are reaching out to classroom teachers to work collaboratively together to design learning experiences that students will dig into that will increase their fluency and their metacognition strategies to comprehend text at a higher level. And then what we also notice is we notice that the collaboration that happens within our schools continues to be elevated, where teachers are coming together and asking key questions like around PLCs about what do we do if we get to a place where our students need extra support? How are we intervening? What are we doing to wrap around that student for that student to be successful if they're struggling with certain strategies? What do we notice about things that are going on at school, but also what do we notice about things that are going on at home that we can ensure that we have a full approach to ensuring that both their emotional and social needs are met so that they can actually access the curriculum and learn? And what happens if they already know the material? How do we adjust and how do we pivot and how do we understand what we need to be able to do to create those experiences? And this is, a, this is where learning takes patience and time because we recognize that we have to get to know our students really well, we have to get to know where they are, and we have to be able to build strategies that are gonna meet them where they need uh, the, the areas of need so that they can be successful. And then we also have created multiple resources, and I'm gonna just access the link here. Oh. Okay, I'm, I don't think it opened it up. I gotta log in. Actually, I, I can log in, it's okay. It'll just take me a second. So while I'm doing this, uh, you should be making connections. You should be wondering. Uh, you should be visualizing what success looks like when I get this going. Learning takes patience and time. While you're logging in, uh, we do have one question. So maybe that would be a, a great time. Tristy Todd. Well, yeah, I think you've got a little bit more right now. <laughs> 
That's um, very good. It's okay, making a connection. So, um, uh, it, it, it's going to you, uh, John. Okay. okay. Um, here, because I, I was reading something recently about reading research, and again, they found in the most current reading research that phonological awareness and phonomes are kind of key. Yeah. And and so, if you look at our trends right now, they're kind of <laughs> they're they're going this way, and uh, you know we're we're noticing we're identifying through EDI and other instruments that our kindergarten kids aren't necessarily coming in with. Um, the alphabetical, you know, like that knowledge, and so we're doing we're doing a bigger stretch. So it's good to see that you've got systematic planning to bridge that gap. Um, when it comes to reporting, because I know PM benchmarks are what you you base a lot of your assessment on. Um, has there been thought of kind of flipping it to a growth mindset, where you you go and you take like term one, their their PM benchmark, like say a three. And then at the end of grade one, they're at a 12. And so you just show the growth of each reader versus the absolutes in emerging or meaning. So, so two really, really important points. One, um, yes, our students are not coming into kindergarten where they might have in the past in terms of their reading readiness and even readiness just to be uh, in kindergarten and in a classroom. Um, and the EDI has said that very clearly, and that is one of the reasons also, I mean, because we're, we're not blaming kindergarten teachers for the fact that students are not ready. You're right, we have to have a really intentional program uh, in order to get them to that place by grade one now, which is the, the whole reason behind the, um, the Word Works Daily. The second piece that you talked about was that growth piece, and that's the, that really should be the fo focus, and we certainly are, are really um, trying to uh, ensure that that's the focus within the school. As a district, we need to know where we are uh, systemically because we need to just figure out where do the supports need to go. Um, so we need that knowledge and we need to know if we're making a difference with the strategies that we have. But in terms of within the school, um, really it should be about is Johnny actually showing growth? And if Johnny is not continuing to um, grow and to, and to um, pick up those skills, then what are we doing about that to ensure that he does? And that's absolutely really important. So, Don, I have a question for you. Um, speaking of not ready for kindergarten, um, so what, what from a school district perspective or from a board perspective could be done to bridge that gap between that early childhood learning um, and that school readiness in terms of emotional, social, mm -hmm. and um, then reading readiness? These kids are getting a lot of technology. They can, you know. So reading isn't, isn't the issue. It's that social and emotional piece. But because it's, it's before kindergarten, as a district, where do you find that space to build that bridge, and what, where would you go in terms of government to meet that gap? So, um, as a district, we work with our community partners to try to address some of these issues, and with our com community partners, we sit down and we look at things like the EDI to try to guide what work we want to do and how we want to advocate for, for services and those kinds of things. One of the other things, Shelley, that, that we've been noticing is that the oral language of, of learners coming into kindergarten is low as well, which then, you know, you wonder about the devices, you wonder about the, and I'm not talking about the learners on devices. What about parents on devices? Because when you're on a device, you're not actually having conversation with your child. And so we're noticing a big difference in terms of the oral language, which then also impacts the, um, the literacy. So um, we're, for instance, uh, uh, last year we did, we worked with our community partners on um, a child day, the year before we'd done baby day. Child day was all about um, talking with your child. And, uh, and getting off the device and actually having those conversations with the child. So simple messages out to parents um, through different community organizations, through Fraser Health, um, so that we really get that message out there that this is really important. So we have to continue down that road and look at what we're... Pardon me? 
Uh, I don't know there are backpacks. I think they got little bags. So it was that church in the valley? Oh, we brought them in for you. I'm sorry, Joe. That's yes. Okay, right, thank you. That's that's what that was. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, okay, so over to you. Thank you. Uh, so the ideas to action in terms of what we see in our schools around the professional learning piece. Uh, our teachers attend prof professional learning activities, and they also have access to resources. And our, our instructional services team has done a magnificent job of collating and. Uh, compiling different information for teachers to access so that they have the resources available to be able to have high-level assessment techniques within the classroom and high-level instructional strategies for the students to be successful. So this is an example uh, from OneNote. Uh, within OneNote, you'll see the literacy tab. These are all the different uh, resources that our teachers have built through instructional services that they can access that, again, puts us in a place of alignment in terms of what we're doing. And also within inside of each of these different uh, components is the innovation that our teachers bring to those experiences in the classroom and how they elevate um, the resource to ensure that they are meeting the needs of those students uh, within their uh, learning experience. And then finally, uh, the last artifact is just the celebration we have uh, with our principals and vice principals sharing the messages out to our community. So uh, we, build this, uh, we build this common language within our school and we're able to articulate with our teachers and our support staff and our principals and vice principals around the work we're doing around the vision we have for literacy. We have instructional strategies set up and assessment strategies set up. Uh, we're asking the right questions inside the building and one of the, the um, obstacles is how do we actually elevate this outside the building. And so our uh, principals and vice principals and our staffs are making that learning visible outside of the building and sharing the successes that are going on and also sharing the opportunities for uh, uh, our parents to be a part of this journey with us. So as we go forth, educating the things we're doing inside the building, celebrating those successes, and also inviting parents into our buildings to learn alongside us so that they have the tools at home to support their uh, their children in their in the literacy journey as well. So I've uh, had the opportunity over the last little while to dig deep, a little deeper into the data um, because as we've talked about already as a district, we're really trying to determine how we're doing. Um, so I just want to give you a little context. Um, Assistant Superintendent Bradford already talked about our school visits. Um, so every uh, th two to three months, we get the opportunity to talk with all of our principals and vice principals in their schools regarding their action plans about, you know, how are you doing with your kids? Um, during the year, having those conversations with our administrators and hearing the stories of individual students and the successes that we were finding with those students was amazing. Um, Trustee Todd, thank you for your question. I think that was an, uh, an excellent question because those are the successes that I think we were celebrating throughout the year. Um, and we continue to celebrate because I think having uh, moving students uh, from where they are to wh wherever we can get to in a year, whatever their year's learning is, is really what we're looking for. And so the, the data overall, the numbers piece, um, comes out as, as the non-emotional part of the, the information that we're getting, uh, the overall information. So when we were about to get the information, the data piece, I was actually really excited based on the conversations that we were having with, with our individual principals. So when I, when I saw the data, um, I was kind of like, w w wait a minute. Um, this isn't the story that I was hearing in schools around the growth of, of, our, of our readers in our schools. And I think it really lends to the fact that, that Trustee Todd's comment around the fact that individuals were moving. Um, but were they moving from one reading level to the next or were they getting to the grade, uh, to grade level um, like we wanted them to be? The data there shows our, our P level data, which is reading at the end of grade three, um, in a comparison data of the last three years. And we, okay, on, on the surface, it doesn't look like we're growing. The, 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 the orange line above is our O level data, which is just approaching with our IEPs and AEPs included in that number. And we're sitting somewhere around 78% for, for that number. That's something we need to celebrate. Um, because I did something today um, <laughs> that I'm, I'm not sure, I was like, do I tell the story or not tell the story? Because really, my section, my section was about inferring and digging deeper. Um, so I dug a little deeper because 
level three, grade three, at the end of grade three reading at P level, um, what does it mean? I'm a secondary guy, and so I put myself through the uh, same uh, process that a, that a grade three child would go through, and I did the reading myself. Um, <laughs> I'm reading beyond grade level for grade three, just, <laughs> just uh, if, for grade three. Okay. Yeah, because of the grade three. Um, but the, the, yeah, Gord, yeah, that wasn't part of the interview process. We are, we are recording this, Order. aren't we? Yeah, okay. Anyway. So, Again, it's about getting in the shoes of our children and realizing that in a 250-word passage, you have to have 98% accuracy um, on, a, on, a, on a read that you haven't seen before in front of a teacher who's taking down information. Um, and it's independent, so nobody's helping you. That's, that's not easy. That's, the expectations for our students are high. I think that's the piece that I needed to get across. And the difference between O and P is not a big difference because you're looking at four to five errors in 250 words for a student. And you just go to six or seven, and now you've dropped a reading level. So again, that's just the, the fluency piece. The other piece is the comprehension piece. It's the second piece of that. And again, the, what we're asking from our students is actually quite, uh, quite difficult, and I think the fact that we're achieving where we are and approaching grade levels at 78% is actually a celebration. So again, how do we dig deeper into the numbers that we have in front of us? We've got, yes, yeah, 63, 64, 63 at P+, plus, but look at our O numbers. Look at where we are as far as the growth in our O's and where we've got to if we include O's in the I, I, IEPs and the AEPs. 78%, if our goal is at 80, we're getting there. And I think really just understanding how close we are to that next level is really a celebration. The other piece of the data I think that something I didn't put up there is in the last five years, we had 21% of our students, and five years ago we had 21% of our students not meeting expectations in reading. We're down to 15% in that category. Are we perp no, do we wanna to get to 100%? Absolutely but we have to celebrate the work that we're doing because I know that the stories from our schools, from our classrooms, with our teachers and our support staffs are all positive stories and we're gonna continue to see those because guess what, we're in year one. There's lots more room to grow. We're gonna get a whole bunch of more positives happening. So again, looking at this, the growth in the O level is actually uh, quite substantial um, over the last, uh, between last year and this year. So we are getting there. And again, the difference between O and P, trust me, is not that big of a difference. So proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so as you've heard the presentation and you've made connections, you've visualized what success looks like, you've asked questions and thinking about those questions, and you've inferred in terms of digging deeper into the data. Um, come to a place of taking a pause and thinking about when you actually drill into that data, that data tells a story. And behind the numbers are kids in seats in our schools or crisscross on carpets in our classrooms, learning at each and every day the best they possibly can in the environments they are. We have our staffs working extremely hard to try and meet the needs of each one of them, knowing that each one of them comes with a different story. And what we want to be able to achieve is every story having a sense of belonging in our building. And when we think about the numerical data that we provide, how do we actually look beyond that data to really capture the stories that are having tremendous impact in the lives of our students? So if you look at this picture, and you look at the way the, the uh, picture is phased out, you could put a numerical or you could put a proficiency scale to it and you might look at it not yet, minimally meeting, fully meeting, exceeding expectations just by the way the picture is set up. So let's take, just for an example, let's take fictitious name Kyle is not yet meeting. And let me share Kyle's story for you. So Kyle actually didn't start in our district. Kyle started in kindergarten in another district. In kindergarten, Kyle missed over 40 days of attendance. And that didn't include his lates. Almost nearly half of his year was disrupted by either not going to school or being late. At the end of kindergarten, he moved three times in grade one. 
new schools, new communities, and in the first month of his grade one year, he lost one of his parents. His other parent that was taking care of him couldn't deal with the situation, lots going on, decided to give Kyle up to an acquaintance or a friend. The acquaintance or friend took care of Kyle as best as they possibly could. Through grade one, Kyle moved again to a new school, a new community, finally landing in our district in May. Landing in one of our schools, Kyle now had outside agencies who had come into his life. Still, by the age of six, Kyle had been through some traumatic events in his life. He enters our school in May of grade one with obviously very limited understanding of any sort of letters, letter blends, letter sounds, phonemic awareness. He is pre-K when he comes to us at the end of grade one. But before we can even think about how we support Kyle, with his academic needs, we need to be able to build his social emotional learning. We need to wrap around this student for the student to be successful. We need to access as many supports as we possibly can for Kyle to be successful. So Kyle doesn't have very much trust with adults. So it takes time and it takes patience. It takes many different people in our schools to try and support him, to get him to be part of the learning environment. The behaviors are evident. He cannot access the curriculum because he doesn't have the skills to be successful. So the behavior is on display. So we wrap around Kyle as much as we can to provide those supports. We put in counseling. We, put in, we connect with outside agencies to uh, put in grief counseling for him. We put in youth care workers to deal with uh, self-care and being able to manage himself. We access SEAs to support him on a daily basis of building his confidence up and feeling like he can belong in that environment. We provide adaptations within the classroom so the teacher creates opportunities for him to access that curriculum at the right point. Outside resource teachers of the uh, classroom work with him inside the classroom. We have um, uh, learning commons teachers coming in to support. We have noon hour supervisors coming in to support. We have um, uh, principals coming in to support to make sure that we have the supports necessary for him to be successful, just to get him in a place of being socially, emotionally balanced to be able to take on uh, learning. So as he enters the end of grade one, he is really just really at the end of kindergarten as a reader. He now has letters. He might have some letter sounds and letter blends. He has some sight words. And so he enters grade two, and the whole idea for Kyle is to get him to be successful by the end of grade two so that he can read. So what do they do? They implement basically every day two adults are reading with him and multiple adults in the building. So in, a, in a five days, he would have two different adults each day reading with him, comprehensively working on his literacy with him through the whole year. Every single day, he gets intervention around literacy. Behavior starting to improve. Surprise, surprise, because now he can access the curriculum. Now he's starting to be successful. As they move towards the end of grade two, they are hoping they can get him to grade level. They are working collectively as a team. 17 adults in the building have wrapped around Kyle to make sure that he can be successful. They get to the end of grade two, and Kyle is not yet meeting expectations. He's close. He's minimally meeting, but he's not there. But a massive gain. So of course we know what, we, what happens over summertime. We know what happens to a lot of our students, especially knowing the circumstance that Kyle's come from. He would go home over the summertime, and we all can infer what's going to happen. He's going to regress. The first day he enters into school, it's like a race for the Learning Commons teacher and the principal to get to Kyle first to see where he's at because they want to support him. So the Learning Commons teacher sits down with him. They begin to read. The Learning Commons teacher connects with the principal and says, you're not going to believe this. Kyle's reading at the end of grade three. He's already made it to the end of grade three. 
And the principal sits down with Colin and says, what happened? He said, I went home over the summertime and I read every single day. I had enough skills to be successful and I continued to read, I continued to read every day by myself to get to a place where I knew that the words on the page made complete sense to me. And I just continued to go and go. And so this student, when you drill down the data and you think about this student in grade two, not yet meeting expectations, going into grade three, and what the school did is they put the, the same teacher he had in grade two is now teaching him in grade three. And he has familiarity in that building, he has a sense of belonging. These are all the supports that went in for Kyle. So you can talk about different strategies that we've shared with you today. And you can see the big picture and the things that we're doing. And then when you drill past what the data says and you see the, the incredible work that our staff's doing to support the students in our district to create hope and opportunity for them so that they can transition out of our schools into places that they want to be able to have a sense of belonging, uh, a sense of uh, uh, purpose in what they're doing in life. These are the stories that dig deeper into the data. So for Kyle and all those students who are working uh, for in our district, I hope our presentation reinforced that learning takes patience and time. It is about memory, history, and story. It is about recognizing the consequences of our actions and what we do to make impact. And if we continue to think about thinking that what we're doing and we continue to apply the strategies for to be successful, as Assistant Superintendent Gill said and Director of Instruction Tomlinson said, we will get to a place of growth with each of our kids for them to be successful as they graduate and leave us in grade 12. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was quite the report. Uh, how exciting. I do have a speaker's list, but I just want to start off by saying that that, that was really inspiring to see that uh, as a board, we received a report uh, the superintendent had identified the area of literacy, the goal, and, and identifying those gaps, and to see this type of, of work and wraparound coming together and coming back with a report so quickly really speaks to the dedication of the people that work in this district every day. So thank you for such an exciting and inspiring report. Um, the first speaker on my first time speaking was is uh, Trustee Perot. I have uh, David Todd on the second time speakers list, so I will going to go to Trustee Pro. Then I'm going to go to uh, Trustee Ross. <coughs> Absolutely lovely. Thank you so much, all three of you, and the extension of your team. It's so critically important, your work. Um, in the longevity and sustainability of our kiddos as they go into society as adults. And um, that, that piece that you're doing with wrap around and, and catching them when they're really young is critical. Um, I have a question. My question's really wrapping around moving more into the secondary school. This report really targeted K to eight. And I think, you know, when I think of my own journey as a parent, my work that I do, uh, I'll lean into kiddo's journey, which a couple of you know very well, um, he didn't start reading until grade five. Um, and that demanded all stressors completely removed in order for him to really find his way with literacy. So his, his pathways weren't typical in terms of what you described. And, and many of our kids are like that, where uh, Superintendent uh, what do you, it, you described like a, a trajectory, like a pathway in which we go, right? And our kiddos who have uh, neurodiverse minds that are hardwired different, their pathways aren't that way. And so when you get uh, individuals like one of my kiddos uh, who did not um, have an opportunity to learn until grade five and all of a sudden the light bulb went off and it was amazing and it continues to be this really cool thing to watch and opportunity for celebration. Um, coming into high school, I know that um, that transition to progress in literacy becomes a continual challenge. So it's that comprehension piece um, to output. So I got it, but how do I get it out now? And so what I'm interested in understanding, what are we doing to look forward and scaffolding those steps to help our kids? You know, we have like our, our kids 
to, to capture those pieces because I, I real time am witnessing that challenge right now. And so I'm kind of going, how are we capturing those those kiddos who are really wrestling with the, the Kyles, right? Great success, but I know down the road from experience, a lot of the Kyles are going to do what you know, we're experiencing at home where that written output piece is a real challenge and time's ticking now because they have to have that credit. So if you can help me understand that, that would be really lovely. Thanks. So uh, a couple things. Um, first of all, let me give you an example because we're starting to do this work in secondary schools and we're, we're just starting to delve into it. We're working actually with ACSS right now on a pilot project. Um, we just um, did reading assessments on all the grade nine students and they, we, we went into ACSS saying um, we wanted to know if they wanted to embark on this pilot project around every teacher is a literacy teacher in secondary and what does that look like. Uh, and we had a lot of ahas along the way uh, because secondary teachers tend to identify themselves uh, with their discipline area. They don't identify themselves as literacy teachers. They don't really, you know, they don't have a good um, comprehension always as to what does that mean when we say you're a literacy teacher. So we, we delved into it with them. Uh, 17 teachers on the staff became part of a literacy uh, committee, uh, range in every discipline area. And we actually worked with them, with 10 of them, uh, over a period of, of a couple of days looking at reading assessments of the grade nine students and there was a lot of assumptions that were made um, by teachers and so a lot of surprises when i actually spoke earlier about the surprises that we sometimes find uh, when we start looking into the data there were a lot of surprises in that group uh, actually about how fluent their readers were they didn't realize how fluent they were and we then we dug in a little deeper and you know the comprehension we needed to work on so really it's about being again um, intentional about uh, the fact that our students haven't, um, we don't stop teaching them how to read at grade three. That's kind of been the norm. Um, and so we're really, we've been pushing that K to eight that we're all literacy teachers and now we're looking at the secondary. And what does that um, look like in your discipline? When you're looking at science, how do you, how do you read um, the research on something? How do you read for meaning? How do you read that kind of text? For meaning. If you're in the auto shop, how do you access that information in order for you to know what to do next on the, you know, the repair that you're doing? So what does it look like in each of those discipline areas? And how do we break it down for students to support them, not just expect that they have those skills coming in? So that's one piece of that, Suzanne. And then the other piece is, when you talk about the output, is that we're recognizing that output, output is not always um, necessarily writing. So how are other ways that students can demonstrate their learning? And we're really trying to move along that, um, that continuum of what does evidence of learning really look like? How do you know your students know it's not always about writing something? So we're working on that. I think there's still lots of work to do, but there's amazing work that's being done in the secondary schools already. And there's a real uh, eagerness to learn more about that because we're seeing that, that, that that's one of the challenges for our students, so that they don't have um, uh, strong enough literacy skills in order to access the curriculum in each of the discipline areas. So how can we support them with that? So I'm really excited to, um, to see what happens with ACSS so that we can learn from that experience and start to branch into secondary schools and start to um, help everyone become literacy teachers. You're welcome. Thank you so much. So on the first time speakers list, I have Trustee Ross and then Trustee Wilson. Then on the second time speakers list, I have Trustee Todd and Vice Chair Coburn. So we'll go uh, Trustee Ross. Thank you. Uh, my question is really kind of ditto on the last one. So kudos for the uh, Suzanne for asking it. Um, um, so uh, as you go to visit these principals and you have a discussion with the secondary principals, um, how is that discussion different than an elementary school? And, and I'm not sure how you're going to respond, but I'd just be interested if there's anything at all that you can shine a little light on. Yeah, I, mean, I, I can speak to that because I think I, I come from the elementary world. So when I have a conversation with our secondary principals around, um, first of all, it's for, for me in terms of understanding um, the complexities of each of the departments in terms of how the, the departments are communicating around one specific goal. 
And I think the questions that I'm curious about when I'm meeting with them are like when we're looking at our grade eight students or our grade nine students, what do we know about these students? And uh, who are the students that we know that have strengths in different areas and who are the students that we need to support specifically? And where are we gathering that information from? So um, is it because they've come from grade seven to grade eight, do we start all over again? Or is there things that we can learn from their elementary years? And again, it goes back to that story. What are all the pieces along the way that we know about this student that is going to provide us with information that will be able to support them in a greater way when they do the transition um, events between the secondary and the middle schools or the secondary and elementary schools, what information are we picking up that's going to ensure them to be successful? And then as the year goes on, my questions revolve around the individual students. Like, what is going on? Who are the ones that you're most concerned about? And how, as a larger uh, system, are you supporting the student in multiple uh, subject areas? And how do we look through the places of what does literacy look like in each one of those departments? So as uh, Don mentioned, how do we really have an understanding that it's all our responsibility to teach? So when kids transition from grade eight to grade nine and so forth all the way up, we've actually built the scaffold necessary for them to be successful in literacy. Uh, so when they graduate, they'll be successful. Thank you. Trustee Wilson. Oh, oh thanks. <laughs> So my question is to do with, um, I remember when my kids were in school, the home reading uh, work that every parent kind of sometimes dreaded if you were busy with other things that night and having to initial the little calendar and just send it in and being ashamed if, you know, there was five nights instead of seven. And so I'm wondering if... <laughs> I'm wondering if because we've noticed um, that they're not as ready uh, to read in, in K and that it's probably due to technology and sort of not engaging as much in conversation and stuff, are we still putting a focus on sending home home reading and are parents, because they're kind of failing, well not failing, but they're not as engaged in the, the younger years, are, is it a lack of engagement are you finding in the home reading program as well or you know uh, I can speak from a place of vulnerability because I don't trust all of you. I uh, I made the assumption I made the assumption that K to five, K to seven, that we had uh, at six to eight we had home reading programs established in all of our elementary and middle schools. And it was just uh, from my experiences of being a building principal, being a classroom teacher, that's just what I did in my classroom, or I did with the, our school in terms of what it was going to look like from K to five or K to seven. So it's about building a unified approach around that and, and sitting down and having conversations about what sort of things uh, can we do to support the home reading? What sort of resources can we be able to supply uh, students that don't have access to those resources? Uh, what sort of things do we need to do with our community partners to support parents to have the actual ability to sit down and work through a home reading program with uh, with their with their children, and I would say, from my own perspective, that that's the most important thing you could be doing at night with your child. So, um, homework should be going home that students are. It shouldn't it shouldn't have anyone helping them with their homework. They should be able to do it independently, and the reading is something that should be a shared experience and a joyful experience for them. So. You're hoping that you're building that throughout our system. And it's something that this year, Assistant Superintendent Gill, Gill and myself are asking our principals about what does that look like in your school and uh, where do you see the strengths and where do you see the gaps? So, yeah. Thank you. So the last two speakers I have on the list, are, which are our second time speakers list, is Trustee Todd and then Vice Chair Cope. I'll be brief. Um, I picked up two little treasures out of the, the book that you distributed, uh, Assistant Superintendent Gill, and that was to teach that mistakes are a normal part of the learning process. And I just thought that's so powerful. And also the idea that you put relationship back into reading, and, and that's so critical, those two things. Um, I also want to say thank you to the three of you and thank you to everyone out there that makes a difference in Kyle's 
life. All right, Vice Chair Kroger. What Dawn was talking about, you were um, talking about what reading looks like and, and with secondary teachers and, and um, understanding that kids aren't reading the same and all that. And I'm just wondering with relationships with teaching schools, like in the teaching schools, is there a shift in how we are understanding, like to your knowledge, right, so UBC, SFU, and UFV, are, is that teaching school shifting with where we are shifting so that when our teachers are coming out that this is, you know, if we're identifying this as a problem of the times, then I'm just wondering if there's an adjustment to the pedagogy that's happening prior to getting out of the gate. An excellent question. Uh, and we've been doing, uh, you know, we have ongoing conversations with our teacher training programs. Uh, and uh, I started some conversations with them when I first came into this role two and a half years ago. I managed to get them all in the same room at the same time just to, to seek understanding about what they were doing in each of their programs so that I could understand because what I was seeing was some, some gaps. Uh, there were some things that I found out and I'm hoping um, are changing and that um, we really need to speak up in terms of how important our, um, the literacy piece is. Uh, we have heard things ranging from um, teaching training institutions that have reading instruction as an elective, um, so you can choose to take it or not, and to me that's not, it's not an elective, it's not, it's a non-negotiable. So I, I think one of the things that um, maybe helps set this in context is um, we're doing a lot of work around literacy. Um, we're, we're really forging ahead. When I talk to other districts, uh, um, many, if not all of them, feel that their literacy results are not where they should be, but they've been kind of struggling as to where do you start with this. Um, so really excited about the work that we're doing in trying to create a unified approach, not a prescriptive approach, but a unified evidence-based approach with students, but my hope is, is right now what we're doing is we're doing a lot of backfilling with new teachers. So we're working with them through the mentorship program with Brenda Barlow, through some of the other things that we're doing, through the Balanced Literacy Guides, all of those pieces are attempting to also put a little bit of a stop gap where we, we're not seeing um, all of our teachers that are coming out of teacher training right now having the tools in their tool belt to do this work. And when I think back when I first started teaching and I taught grade two, um, it took me a while, it took me three years before I felt more comfortable and confident about my, um, my literacy instruction, even though I had taken that um, work. So we have a lot of new teachers in our system that either do have the tools or don't have the tools but are still struggling just to um, uh, work with classroom management and all those other things so that they can do these wonderful things. And so we're, we're really working hard right now so, to support our teachers um, with that work. Beginning, being a beginning teacher is very, very difficult, very challenging, challenging work. Um, we hope that we're trying to bring some clarity to it through some of these anchor documents so that they aren't looking at, well, what's in now, what's out, I heard this, I heard that. Um, it's no, this is, this is evidence-based strategies to use and, and if you don't understand something, then come and we'll talk to you about that and we'll, we'll help you, we'll support you with that. Um, long answer to a very important question. Thank you. So I uh, just once again, um, as a you know, superintendent's report, I'd like to thank the superintendent and his fantastic team. Thank you for coming to present. Thank you, uh, superintendent, for providing the board uh, this opportunity to hear uh, about the progress that's been made on the district goals. Quite often as a board, we, we are excited about the goals that are set, and then it becomes even more exciting to see how it's getting put into action and what sort of measures are being taken and the progress that's being made. So thank you for the hard work uh, of everybody on, in this team and in our district for seeing this goal come to fruition. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to hear about your excitement tonight. So we are now going to need
um, a motion. So we need a mover that the Board of Education receives the superintendent's report on balanced literacy for information as presented. Moved by Trustee Todd, seconded by Trustee Ward. Any more comments or questions on that? Right, seeing none, all those in favor? Motion's carried. We're now on to the Secretary Treasurer's report. So over to you, uh, item 7.1, RA Mountain Secondary Easement and Covenant Bylaw. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as uh, I've spoken with the, the board in the past, uh, when we uh, were building uh, what was the Willoughby Area Secondary, which is now named the RA Mountain Secondary, uh, the site that we had didn't allow for the parking requirements uh, that township had uh, required for with the, the permitting and the design of that building. Um, so we've been working with uh, the township on a resolution uh, for that. And part of that resolution was when we switched uh, what was RE Mountain into uh, the new Peter Ewart Middle School. Uh, it had uh, more than enough parking for that school and, and maybe enough for <laughs> the high school as well. Um, uh, so we had conversations with Township about being able to use some of that excess parking at that site as uh, part of the requirement for it. So uh, for that new high school, we required uh, 450 stalls. We were only able to accommodate 324. Uh, but with this agreement, we have been able to carve out 126 spots. We only needed 124, but the lines worked better with 126, so we just went with that. Uh, and it also uh, allowed us, um, the way it stands right now, we have the two pieces of property. Uh, there is a, a road that Township owns uh, between that to access their uh, park in the back. Uh, this agreement also gives us uh, free use of that uh, road uh, to access our two buildings back and forth, partially for the parking, but also just for the function of those two schools as the district. So these would be two agreements that would be tied to all three of those pieces of land uh, going forward. And uh, I would leave that with you uh, for the three readings of that bylaw tonight. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the report, Secretary mm -hmm. Treasurer. So trustees, uh, with these bylaws, we do need to do three readings for them to come into effect. So we <coughs> are going to uh, start off. Uh, we have all received a copy of the details. Uh, so attached, we will be reading and we will be moving first, uh, that the school district number 35 Langley property bylaw 2019-03, access and parking easement and covenant at RE Mountain Secondary School be given three readings at this meeting. So that is the first recommendation. So um, we will uh, start with a mover on that. So moved by Trustee Perot, seconded by Trustee Ross. All those in favor? Second recommendation that school district number 35 Langley property bylaw 2019-03 access and parking easement and covenant at RA Mountain secondary, secondary school be approved as presented a first time. So moved by Trustee Wilson, seconded by Trustee Todd. Um, any comments or questions on that? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? Motion is carried. Second recommendation is that school district number 35 Langley property bylaw 2009-03 access and parking easement and covenant at RE Mountain Secondary School be approved as presented a second time. May I please get a mover? Moved by Trustee Ross, seconded by Trustee Ward. Any comments or questions on that? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? Motion is carried. The last one is that school district number 35 Langley property bylaw 2019-03 Access and parking easement and covenant at RE Mountain Secondary School be approved as presented a third time and finally adopted, and that the board's signing officers execute the covenant bylaw. May I please get a mover? Moved by Vice Chair Coburn, seconded by Trustee Ross. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion is carried. That concludes item 7.1. We are now on to item 7.2, enrollment update, uh, enrollment report and funding update. Secretary Treasurer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, every September, uh, we have uh, what we call our 1701 uh, count, which is uh, a critical uh, point in time for this district as that uh, determines the bulk of our funding uh, for the uh, operating year. Uh, and that's done every September 30th. And so I wanted to provide uh, the board uh, with an update on um, the funding impact from that uh, 
1701 count and information on the enrollments. I do want to uh, just uh, put a disclaimer in there that these are not uh, by any means uh, final numbers. Uh, this is, there is still a duplicate resolution process that has to happen between districts. Uh, so these numbers uh, are, are subject to minor change. And it is also assuming that the uh, ministry uh, how they funded us in the preliminary grants on the per pupil amounts uh, would continue um, in, in the, when they do the recalc in December. So we won't actually know our final uh, revenue numbers until uh, December, and it's usually the day before the Christmas break. So I wanted to go through um, just on the revenue side. Uh, the district is expecting, based on the counts, uh, to be up about $1.6 million uh, to an operating grant for the September counts of $185.6 uh, million, uh, million compared to the $184 uh, million in the budget. That is, would be just for the July counts and the uh, September counts. There is still a uh, February and May count uh, that has uh, funding impacts, but for a, a smaller amount than uh, the, the September count. The main driver of that increase is the district has uh, exceeded the enrollment projections that we submitted uh, by 167.625 FTE uh, in our um, K-12 uh, student category, which is just under $1.3 million. That is partially offset by the fact that our uh, alternate programs, uh, the enrollment for those uh, did not actually hit our projection numbers. They were short by 72.625 FTE. so that reduced our funding uh, by just uh, over $466,000. Our um, identified students uh, for special education, uh, you can see that those have increased at all three levels, uh, which is unusual for us. Even our level one uh, numbers uh, did increase this year uh, by two students. Uh, and when you consider that projection was 16 and 18, that's a, a sizable increase. Uh, that number has been around the 16 number for many years. Uh, the level two uh, have increased 27 students and level three have increased 28 students for just over $917,000 in increased in funding for special ed. Uh, the next one, uh, our English language learners, uh, we were down 201 students uh, compared to um, our preliminary estimates, which had a, a sizable impact for us on $300,000. Uh, this is mainly due to our uh, caseless language and the fact that we were trying to get teachers uh, uh, their, the right levels of uh, students per the restored language. And unfortunately, that meant that not all the case students coming in were able to be identified. So we're, unfortunately, that uh, hits our uh, our funding, uh, and uh, those will be identified as the year goes on, obviously, but uh, because of the snapshot, it did come at a, a sizable cost to the district. Uh, the Aboriginal and uh, adults uh, increased just slightly up $54,000, and our summer session for uh, last year increased uh, just over $101,000. So that's the breakdown of the $1.6 million in funding. A little further information on some of the numbers. Uh, you can see that our school-age students on a headcount basis compared to last September uh, climbed up uh, 354 students, so that's sizable growth. Uh, for the first time in a while, our FTE numbers actually uh, were less than our headcount numbers. Uh, we at, have, uh, at grades 10 to 12, we are funded per course. Uh, the district has always or the last number of years has taken uh, more than the eight course uh, is required, but this year that average actually declined for the first time where it dropped to 8.28 courses per uh, eight to 12 student versus 8.32 the previous year. Uh, so that was a little different for us and something we'll be uh, looking into. Um, and you can see that the other categories didn't change a lot for graduate adult and non-graduate adult. International students are down about 49 students. Um, we're still hoping that we can make up some of those. Uh, we won't hit the, the uh, over 1,000 students that we had uh, last year. We're trying to get up to the 990 uh, target, uh, which uh, we still have a second semester, and we do keep bringing in students uh, as we uh, go through the year. But we've uh, found uh, that there is a demand still in China, but the government is not allowing student visas on a timely basis, and that is impacting the number of students that we're seeing uh, from our China market. And we've offset a lot of that with other markets, but we haven't been able to absorb uh, those delays 
um, not fully. So uh, we'll, we're like, going to keep an eye on that as, as that uh, continues uh, over the, the rest of this year and, and into to next year. This slide here shows uh, the growth by kind of age categories. Uh, this year we saw kind of a reverse of the trend the last two years where K uh, wasn't hitting the numbers that we'd seen. And I, on the next slide I'll show you a, a longer uh, trajectory for that. Uh, we had growth at uh, every grade except for 8 to 10. Uh, so that was the only grade that declined. Uh, one that uh, is a little shocking to us is the increase at 11 and 12. Uh, we had a sizable uh, jump in our 11 to 12 category this year, which has uh, not been the trend over the last couple of years, which you can see on this slide. Um, if you look at the, the 12s in 2014, they were 3,200, and they're up to th just under 3,400, and, and 116 of that was uh, just in this year. So uh, we've seen a difference in that trend. You can see, as I mentioned, in K, we'd uh, had a couple years uh, of growth there, and then it had started to, to drop down, and we have a nice jump back up. In, in this year or so, uh, but you can see growth at uh, every age group over the, the five-year uh, time horizon. This just shows uh, graphically our FTE growth um, since 2011. You can see it's a pretty st uh, steep upward climb. Uh, you can see also the footnote at the bottom there that since 2011, our FTE has increased by 220 or sorry, 2,284 students versus just 2,072 in a headcount. And you can see that we've, uh, over that time horizon, increased the number of courses that our 10 to 12 students have been able to, to take. Uh, and that's why we've uh, seen that uh, other than this year where we, we're still at a, a higher average, but it was the first year that that uh, reversed and it wasn't a growing uh, trend. Our uh, other programs, uh, changes from 2018, uh, Core French uh, is, is up a sizable amount. Uh, there was a school that had reported those numbers incorrectly in the previous year, but we also saw an increased numbers in uh, our four or five splits. Uh, Core French starts typically in five, but uh, with those four or five splits, they get credit for that uh, a year earlier. So uh, that's part of that uh, increase. Uh, the ELL uh, we've uh, mentioned earlier, it's down 77 from the, the previous year uh, and down from projections. And our special ed numbers are up 188 uh, students compared to uh, September uh, at uh, the same time. And uh, when we take a look at our growth by our catchment areas, uh, it shows the ministry funded and international and our grand total. Um, you can see where the bulk of the growth is coming from. Uh, the Arnie Mountain catchment is up 422 students of the 310 uh, that we've grown. So uh, we've seen declines in the uh, Walnut Grove, Brookswood, and Poppy and our choice schools. Uh, for Walnut Grove, uh, most of that uh, is at the elementary grades. The secondary has remained uh, pretty consistent and grew slightly. Uh, but uh, almost all the schools in that uh, catchment saw a fairly sizable decline from uh, last year. Um, and I think uh, that's the last slide I have, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So we do have um, a speaker's list. What I'll do is I'm just going to start off that we get uh, the motion on the floor. So let's get a mover that the Board of Education receives the enrollment report. Funding update for information as presented. Chair Coburn, seconded by Trustee Ross. So the speakers list that I've I've made as I've gone through has been <coughs> uh, Ross, Todd, and then anybody else want to be added to this? No. Okay. So we'll start with Trustee Ross. Thank you. And uh, my classic question is, what keeps you awake at night? What's concerning to you? These are just numbers on the screen to us. So like, I need to know how do you process what what concerns you? Uh, it, specifically to enrollment? Yes, please. Uh, the ones that stood out to me this year and uh, is the ISP, obviously. Mm -hmm. It's the first time that uh, we've seen us um, have any tried and trouble hitting our projection numbers, so that's, that's a little bit of a concern. Uh, and the other one for me that was a surprise was our alternate programs. Uh, the, the decline in those programs is something that I think we need to, to look into. Uh, they've declined a fair bit uh, over what we were at last year. 
Are those choice schools that you're referring to? Uh, that would be all, uh, Vanguard. Vanguard and uh, Choices were the two big ones. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I now have uh, Trustee Todd. Hi. So thank you. Um, yeah, I, I always marvel at, um, like I, I think uh, Trustee Dykeman had said that we've added a, a nice size middle school <laughs> uh, um, in, in our numbers. And um, I'm assuming, um, did, in our budget, don't we always, there was almost extra, three extra divisions or plan for in case of enrollment growth? Because you said this was 160 plus over top of that. In our preliminary budget, we had a contingency of three divisions yeah. uh, that have been now used. Yeah, used. Okay. Um, so, follow up question. Other non funded students, uh, what 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 is the criteria for other non-funded students? Uh, some some of that is our uh, DL and CE programs where they haven't reached um, the eligibility status. So some of those could come back uh, farther down in the year as they uh, they have to hit a certain level of completion and progress in the courses. Thank you. Um, the last speaker I have on the list so far, if anybody else wants to be added, let me know, uh, is Trustee Wilson. Still getting used to this. I'm new. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I just have a quick question about the um, the English language learners, the 201 less. Uh, you mentioned something due to the um, class size and composition language. So, are those students identified already as ELL, or that we're struggling to identify them because we don't have the resources to identify them? They haven't been identified yet. Typically, at this point, we've already identified the incoming case. We weren't able to get to them because of the case list for the ELL teachers. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't have any further speakers. Um, and I, the trustee uh, Todd stole my, my line. I was going to say, we once again have, in our district, added another, another smaller but nice-sized uh, elementary school. So this growth is... Uh, something that uh, is, I think is going to continue for a while, and then us as a board will have to continue to uh, remind Victoria that we we need we need more schools, we need more money. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for the report. It was uh, interesting to see how over the years uh, enrollment shifts and moves, and what goes up and what goes down. So, these trends are are very interesting, and something that will be uh, great to see how it's going moving forward. So we do uh, have the recommendation that the Board of Education receives the enrollment report funding update for information, which has been moved by Trustee Coburn, or Vice Chair Coburn and seconded by Trustee Ross. Uh, any other comments or questions on that? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion is carried. We're now on to new business. So um, on our agenda, we have uh, under new business uh, two motions that were served as a notice of motion by Vice Chair Coburn at our last meeting, and we did add 8.3, which was correspondence, which was pulled off. So we will start with um, 8.1 Knox Loan Kits. I will hand this over to Vice Chair Coburn to read her motion, speak to it, um, and then uh, we'll, get, we'll need a mover and a seconder for the motion. Okay, so would you like me to read the motion? Okay, so we'll, we'll start off with the motion. And then come. Oh yes, yeah. so uh, I did. I was remiss in our opening when I introduced everybody to uh, let everybody know that Vice Chair Coburn had let me know that it is International Day of the Cat. Yes, it's International Cat Day today. So uh, at the yeah, see. so at the end of the meeting during comments, uh, Trustee Coburn uh, will be reminding everybody of that. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I will start off then by uh, stating the motion for you um, that's on the agenda. Move it over to you to move. Yeah. We'll get a seconder and then speak away. Okay, so 8.1 is Knox Loan Kit. So uh, the motion that Vice Chair Coburn has filed is the Board of Education directs staff to investigate and report back to the board on the costs, benefits, desire of the community and feasibility of having Knox Loan or other antidotes on all SD35 sites. So could I please get a mover? That would be moved by uh, Vice Chair Coburn. Seconder, please. Seconded by uh, Trustee Perot. I assume the mover would like to speak to the motion. Yeah, I, All right. 
There you go. So I have a, provided you all with a little rationale, um, and I'm just going to read this uh, a little bit briefly. So the rationale is, um, given how tainted the drug supply is, experts warn that the crisis will not be going away anytime soon. In fact, the prediction is it will get worse. And although some stabilization is being seen throughout the province, there is a noticeable increase in two groups, namely women and children. According um, to the Fraser Health Region website, while rates overall are lower than in other age groups, death in people 19 and under does not appear to be decreasing. In fact, in the Langleys, we are seeing a higher percentage of deaths in people 30 and under than across all other Fraser Health Region communities. And it seems that the youth are not getting the message about our toxic drug supply. The question now becomes, should it get worse, what do we have in place? And schools are a very good place to start. Schools are safe spaces, and they are often utilized by the community outside of school hours. Having a kit available in a foyer is a supportive move. And our DPAC president let me know that the Let's Talk About Youth and Drugs sold out within 24 hours and then sold out again in its new location of 260 seats within 48 hours plus a wait list of 20. The community clearly wants response and action. Going forward with this motion is a step in the right direction in keeping our community and our children safe. It shows we are being progressive in our thinking and responding to what our community needs. This is a very important issue that deserves our consideration. This motion is so that the board can receive the quality information that it needs in order to make an informed decision on what, if any, action should be taken. Okay, yes, thank you. So uh, the motion's been moved and seconded. Uh, the uh, mover has opened uh, the debate. Is there anybody else who would like to speak to this motion? Uh, Trustee Ross. So Appreciate the uh, the motion, and uh, so I have some questions about it. So uh, I, I'm not aware of any school district that is currently uh, doing what it says you'd like us to do to all schools. Uh, is there any other school district that we're aware of that uh, is doing this? Mm -hmm. Who's um, doing it then? The superintendent. Uh, Thanks, Trustee Ross. I can't speak to uh, the school district doing all schools. I know Maple Ridge. Mm -hmm. Uh, has it. I'm not sure if it's just secondary or if it's all schools. Okay. Uh, it's their administrators that are responsible for this because when you look at your first aid attendant, uh, there's someone that's responsible to staff, not to students, and there was quite a bit of conversation around whether that would leave them vulnerable if, if they even wish to do that training. Um, there are one I know. I am not sure of uh, others. There are uh, certain sites uh, throughout the province, often in your alternate school world, where you will have uh, that training, uh, but it's specific to the, that site. But there could be more, but that's my knowledge at this point. Uh, okay. Trustee Perot, uh, there's, uh, Vice Chair Coburn just had uh, yeah. some more information on your question, um, and then we'll go back to Trustee so, Ross. Trustee Ross, I'm just asking for a report, and I would hope that in that report, that information would be there. So I'm just asking that we direct staff for a little bit of resources um, their time frame they can let us know to just go gather some preliminary information to see if this is a road we can even go down um, and then at that way we can say to our community listen because of these things we can't do this this way or maybe they would come back with an alternative that would satisfy but until we have that report we can't see um, what other districts are doing or stuff like that so it's just a very preliminary report that I'm seeking ask you a question if I could. So uh, I would, uh, I'm just concerned about liability issues and the superintendent has already sort of mentioned, I guess some teachers just don't want to do it. So it becomes an administrative uh, responsibility. So um, are you aware, uh, superintendent, uh, secretary, treasurer, of any liability issues that would be a red flag that you'd be very concerned about going down this road? Yeah, in, in terms of, um it's really when it comes to youth that you leave yourself vulnerable because we've had cases in the past where we've had staff with first aid training intervene to help the students and they're not medical experts. So uh, sometimes that is, uh, you know, put them into difficult situations. Really the one on this one is, is um, not so much even also the liability. What we're getting from uh, some people in the community is around 
uh, whether uh, a site is known to have this available, whether people feel safer to OD in that area, sadly. And so there has been some pushback in some areas around that. Uh, and where does that leave you? Because it's not a student, it is someone that has come up from the community, maybe an older person in there. Well, how do you respond to those ones? That's wide open, you need to know in terms of things. So to just, uh, there's a lot of questions with this. Um, we have not had anything from Fraser Health to direct us because they're probably facing these same questions about uh, what to do kind of going forward. So it, it is complex uh, in terms of issues around it. So that's the best I can speak to in terms of that, that aspect of it. Sure, thank you. Okay, uh, Trustee Wilson. Okay, there we go. He's new. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, thank you uh, for bringing this motion forward. I too had some different questions um, that have been raised here about first aid and liability, and also I thought I heard once about some place wanting to do it, and there being um, the ambulance and paramedics union having um, something to do with the training. But um, I do believe that this is something we, you know, have a responsibility to investigate at least in a preliminary um, manner such as this to bring all the information to us so that we know what we're talking about before we make any decisions. So I'm definitely in favor of gathering that information. So thank you. Uh, so just uh, before we go to, back to you, Trustee Coburn, I do have uh, Trustee Pro who's on a first time list oh, okay. and definitely you will of course be given an opportunity to close as a mover, but yeah, I just for sure, let's do Trustee uh, Pro first, and then we'll come back. We'd go Trustee Todd, and then back to you, Trustee Coburn. Okay. Doesn't work. No. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for this uh, motion. I uh, I am in support of it. Um, I would be very interested in understanding in the assessment who is our high risk population, what, where our pockets are, mm -hmm. and um, if that is in terms of moving forward, is that could that be something that we're focusing heavily on as the launch? Um, the other question is um, in the motion it says cost benefits desire the community and feasibility. Um, if you could. Please explain to me what desire of community means. And I just quickly, briefly respond to Trustee Ross's question. Maple Ridge, five schools in Victoria, Metro schools in Metro Vancouver have naloxone kits active right now. Yes, so there's the, as there was a direct question, we'll go to Trustee Coburn and then over to Trustee Todd. So um, you asked about the desire of the community. Mm -hmm. Uh, just as some people have pointed out, there's people who are very much in support of it, and then as Gord pointed out, there is some kind of pushback. So I think that a community consultation, um, and people outside of the district, because this community's schools, they come together, and I think that it wouldn't hurt if we asked our community what their thoughts are on it. Um, again, it's just exploratory investigative work, um, and if other districts have it, then it's doable. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Coburn, for bringing this forward. Um, I, I totally appreciate the intent, and it comes from a good place. Um, I, I had similar questions about the consulting the community, and um, and and so uh, in your answer, you've reassured me with that. Um, but I am um, concerned also for staff, be, because right now we're up to our armpits in consultation, and um, it it. To me, a consultation, if it's done right, is going to take some time and, and to be genuine and authentic. Um, I, I do also understand that there's a certain element of timeliness to a proposal like this. Um, if it saves one life, it's an important thing to do. So uh, again, I, I appreciate that. I, I do think we need to consult with the communities and with the parent groups and, and, and start there. And it's a slow, gentle conversation the thing that I've recognized in in working in the education system is it's a very small C conservative group out there and and so um, when we get into conversations like this there's always 
a, a hesitancy and a reluctance to go to issues similar as this. So, thank you. So I do have um, a comment before we go back around. If anybody else wants to speak twice, um, I'm supportive of part of the motion and would support the motion if there was an amendment only. Um, I'm supportive of, you know, we have an investigation report back on certain parts of it, the costs, benefits, and the feasibility, um, because feasibility in, in my mind would cover risks, whether it be yeah. WCB, whether it be, um, you know, Fraser Health, other, other, um, other consultations. I could not support your motion with, if it contained a consultation with the community. And the reason why um, is any, any type of that without getting the first parts um, back uh, would be problematic. So I would support that as a second motion if after the report came back uh, there was then some desire to do that. But I don't believe that when we aren't sure about employment restrictions, uh, risks, legal, whatever, that that should be in there at this point. So if there was a um, an amendment to the motion, I could support it. I couldn't support it with the desire of the community and yet because we have to just do our due diligence in a step. So if you had this and then wanted to bring a subsequent motion, I could support it. But unfortunately, I couldn't support it with that part in it. Um, so yeah, um, I, I think the desire of the community, um, we can look at, we don't even have to do that in terms of that, but desire of the community could be our parent group or is there an appetite for this in the community on a very preliminary? What I'm asking for is an extremely preliminary report. Um, what our team decides is good, they'll bring back. I'm open to a deadline. Um, I don't want it to be a lot of work because we'll know right away if this is a road we could go down. So I don't see a lot of value in doing this big investigative journey when they're going to know very quickly um, if this is something we can do and if that's what they come back with. But I do think it's important, like especially because we are having public meeting and it, our DPAC, that we could at least consult um, our parent community or our DPAC um, and see if, if they know that there's an appetite. I just want to follow up just quickly on that, and then I'll go down to Trustee Ward. I still need that amendment just because we're prescribing um, staff, and DPAC represents a portion of, of our, our community and a significant important portion of our community, but it's still too wide. So I would support that as a second step because if the first step that came back was no, even though, as you've mentioned, there are, there are districts that have that in place. If there was a big obstacle, then I wouldn't want to go to the second step, go out to the community, say to the community, we'd like this input and then be left at the end of the day saying, oh, well, yeah, sorry, we, we, we just stepped a bit too soon. So I would, I would support it if somebody was willing to move um, an amendment to your motion. But we have Trustee Ward next on the speak. Okay, is that right? Okay. Uh, I agree with Trustee Dykeman's uh, comments. I think those are quite relevant and of course, and I would support uh, it with that amendment because I think it is too broad. To so I, uh, would Trustee Ward like to move, okay, move the amendment? Okay, move the amendment. Okay, so you would like to move that strike. that strike desire of the community Correct. at this point. Yep. Um, is there a seconder to that amendment? Seconded by Trustee Perot. Any comments on the amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor? So now we're going back to the main motion, amended striking desire of the community. Um, any other speakers to this motion? We have that moved and seconded. Um, so, uh, uh, but, and that was moved originally by uh, Vice Chair Coburn, seconded by Trustee Perot. All those in favor of the amended motion? Motion is carried unanimously. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Coburn. So you're, you're now on to your second one, which is 8.2, outdoor education at Nickel Meckel Elementary. So I have the motion here, if you'd like me to state it and then move it. Okay, so um, the motion which Trustee uh, Vice Chair Coburn would like to move is that the Board of Education directs staff to report back to the Board on the educational costs and feasibility of making Nickel Meckel Elementary the permanent site for a full outdoor education program in the City of Langley. This investigation is to include consultation with the City of Langley. Would you like to move your motion? Okay, so moved by Vice Chair Coburn. Could I get a seconder on that one, please? Seconded by Trustee Wilson. Uh, would the mover like to open? Sure. 
in the 19th century was a place where children learned through play, often in nature. The schools of today seem somewhat far removed from the original intention. According to the National Wildlife Foundation, the average child spends around 30 minutes of unstructured outdoor play each day, but sadly more than seven hours each day in front of an electronic screen. Although this is an American statistic, research confirms that across similar nations that this is on par. We do see an ever-growing increase in child obesity and ADHD and other mental health problems. And while obesity and poor mental health are complex problems, researchers believe among children the combination of more screen time and less outdoor activity um, is kind of exasperating this. The evidence suggests that viewing, interacting with, and living in natural environments can have multiple effects on reducing stress, increasing patience, increasing self-discipline, increasing capacity for intention, increasing recovery from mental fatigue, or from crisis and psychosocial imbalance. Um, and that, I, and then I went on to say, why, why the nickel mackle? So I took this directly from the City of Langley website, and it says, take him. The word Nicolmackle is from the Hokamanum language used by the Stolo people, meaning the route to go or the pathway. As Langley City continues to grow, and I know this because I was on the Advisory Planning Commission for four years and I saw just how much development is going into Bryden Lagoon, um, they believe that both riverbanks, the presence and value of this beautiful ecological feature can be enhanced to make the river more visible, accessible, and attractive to the broader community. Few places within the city offer such a diverse and rich opportunity for placement and neighborhood design. And I myself can't imagine a better foundation to place an outdoor program on as the river isn't going anywhere. The benefits to the children in this community would be unimaginable and it is important for the board to consider what we can do here. This motion is so the board can have the quality information once again that it needs to make or act upon any actions the board should take. Okay, thank you, Trustee Coburn. Um, just, uh, we've got Trustee Ross. Pay attention. Um, I'm not in favor of the motion. And the reason I'm not in favor of the motion is uh, in talking with staff, they've always said we've got too many choices. And the more choices we offer, we just suck from the regular schools. You know, we're trying to fill up ACSS. We're trying to fill up uh, DW Poppy right now. Um, so we really don't need more competition out there. And so uh, unless I can hear from staff saying, hey, wow, we need another choice program in the district, I can't support it. Does staff have anything they'd like to share to add to my comments? Is there, is there, do we have too many choice programs? Is this going to cause more problems? Um, I know we have an outdoor program already, uh, an outdoor program that's not an outdoor school, per se, but um, if you could just give us some comments, I'd really appreciate it. Trustee Ross, and so I'll have other staff uh, that are here tonight also comment on this one. Uh, outdoors, love it. It was something I could have used as a child. I would have stayed in school more. Uh, the benefits of children being outdoors right across the board is absolutely something we want to strive for right across, right across the board and throughout our district. Um, the outdoor school that we put at Fort Langley was never necessarily meant to be duplicated at numerous sites, even Maple Ridge with the one they have stuck to one site. It's, it's uh, some parents really like to have that as more of something that kids will do 60, 70, 80, or 100 percent of the time. Um, but actually, really, what we hoped for with Fort Langley was, yeah, if you wish to make that choice, you can go there. And I do know there's geographic issues around everybody being able to access, access that. But it was also about learning for our teachers, and. We have a, a place like Parkside, which is another great example. Uh, uh, Carly out there, who's an outstanding teacher, what she's done is say, to say, to, what's stopping any of us from getting outdoors? Uh, as teachers, we have these great resources. It's right outside. We can go at any time. Uh, and I think people are nervous. I think teachers typically just don't feel the confidence or the, of the skills or the resources to do that. And, and I'll ask Don and uh, would he, if either one would like to comment on this, but. Uh, to be quite honest, I'd like to see Douglas Park, I'd like to see Nickel I'd like to see Blacklock, I'd like to see all of them access what is an incredible opportunity in the city, mm -hmm. let alone our other schools, but I'd really like it to be that I don't have to necessarily, I'm not one of the 50 in this program, everyone in that school would be able to access. And So that's kind of a push, but I, again, I, I, a certain Don Woody have done far more here than I have, and I will turn it to them for comment. It's 
been it's been a while. <laughs> Um, so first of all, uh, Trustee Coburn, uh, you're, you are absolutely dead on in terms of the benefits of, of outdoor learning. Uh, I've watched it myself in the outdoor program at Fort Langley Elementary, um, but we've, we've been doing quite a bit of research into it in the last year, and a lot of research has come out quite recent. Um, in fact, last week we had a keynote speaker at our Pro D, Angela Hanscom, and if you haven't re read the book, Balanced and Barefoot, it's fabulous, and it's all about the benefits of of outdoor learning. Um, so fantastic for kids, as particularly in this day and age when kids are not getting outside and they're not getting that connected um, to play. Um, what I would say is what we've done this year is going back to uh, Gord's point about the initial conversations that, that grew into the Fort Langley program were really about how do we get more classes, more students outside more of the time, and how do we support teachers with that? And one of the things that I found out was, just like where it said, is that teachers are nervous to do it. They don't know if they have permission. What permissions do I have to have? How do I incorporate the curriculum into the outdoor learning? So what we did last year was we, um, we uh, put together a huge resource, like the one note that uh, Woody showed uh, you about that we have for staffs just in general about curriculum. We have one of those just for outdoor learning. And the idea is that it provides lots of different access points for teachers. So if you just want to, if you just want to, you're just, you know, the initial point might be, okay, we're going to do sustained silent reading outside the door. <laughs> um, and then it could be as far up as to, you know, um, actually looking at uh, uh, stewardship, environmental stewardship. So there's all kinds of different access points and we're seeing this year, once we did the launch and we did the keynote and we shared the resource with teachers, more and more teachers are taking the learning outside and finding ways to do it. We're, we're now opening up the outdoor program to actually, so teachers can go and watch and to learn alongside of those teachers. You've been there, you know how fabulous they are. Um, but there's lots of learning still to do and that really was the point of that program. So my dream is that we're actually just doing it throughout the district rather than limiting it to a certain number of students who can access that program. then you have all the information. So let's start with Trustee Todd and then over to Trustee Ward. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for bringing this motion before us. I, I, I guess, again, I, I think it comes from a good place. I, I understand the intent and, and outdoor education should not just be one standalone school or, or another standalone school as such. Um, outdoor education is a philosophy and it can be incorporated into many schools, as was already said. Um, I also struggle with, I guess, other parts of this motion where we're actually picking a, a site and oftentimes as a board, we struggle with, is that ours or theirs? <laughs> And, and for this one, I'm not sure we're staying in our lanes with this. And, and we're actually saying, we're directing staff, no, you need to place it in this one spot. So um, I, again, the intent is wonderful and everything, but I, I can't, I'm not willing to move into or prescribing to um, our staff where we should place a, a program at this time. Trustee Ward. Okay. Is it, okay. Uh, again, I compliment a lot of these same ideas. I came into this thinking, uh, for sure, I was going to support it, but you know, with more consideration, I'm, I'm of the mindset of kind of complimenting uh, individual schools. James Hill over here, in I guess in connection with the township, has this little outdoor space. Uh, I think with the I don't know if the pack uh, was involved. I don't know the, the extent, but anyhow, it's a neat little little space there. Uh, it's not identical to the um area, but uh, I, I appreciate where this is coming from. Uh, I, I, I love it. I know with the fundamental school having some uh, picnic tables outside in the middle. I know and anything that gets kids outside, and you can bring bring books. 
Uh, one thing that I did notice with it, um, less physical and outdoor play uh, are the causes. I think are you, you're mentioning about out outdoor play. I think it's incumbent upon PE teachers or whatever to take their kids outside. So I think that's one element. But I think as far as instruction outside, I'd like to see more spaces um, uh, with existing school so I, I'd love to see something prototyped and kind of in a smaller fashion that you could kind of stamp out to other schools um, as it proves its efficacy but uh, overall I love the idea outdoor uh, education so which will let you maybe rebut that too. So I absolutely love the intent of your motion and um, I'm really excited about, you know, you talking about working closer with the city of Langley, which has long been um, a goal of this board. The challenge that I have with the motion has been a little bit um, mentioned by some of my fellow trustees is the challenge that we're faced with with our long-term facilities plan. So as a, as a board, we've come together and we've said, we, we have this long-term facilities plan, we review it as we go. Um, the challenge that I have is that it's really a slippery slope when we start to say, okay, although I know you just want to report to come back, um, it's so on the ground. Like as, as a board, we set a, a long-term facilities plan which was informed by a lot of work by staff and I'm not okay with on, the, on a motion by motion basis changing the focus of where we go. Um, it really is just to perspective uh, prescriptive, there we go, I'm having trouble talking today. Um, but, like, although I can't support your motion, what I would really support is us going back to our joint liaison meeting and having a conversation with the city of Langley on what sort of things that they'd like to see, like we do a lot with the township, um, in our complementing parks to, to make spaces that are education. We don't need a motion to have those preliminary conversations. I just can't although I understand your intent, unfortunately, support this motion, but would you know, really like to see what comes out of um, the committee meetings that both you and Trustee Ward sit on. Is there an opportunity to build some cool spaces and parks because the city is such a beautiful, walkable area, but I just can't, knowing our governance role, say to staff, here's a, here's a one-time motion. I know we have all this other work. Please go out and investigate that. But I do love the intent of what you brought forward and look forward to seeing what sort of ideas can be birthed through the city through our other mechanisms. So thank you for bringing it forward. Um, that's an excellent uh, suggestion. So just a couple of things. Uh, Trustee Raj, you said we have enough choice programs. To my knowledge, and I could be wrong, do we have one choice program in the city of Langley? Uh, superintendent. The clock block, yeah. Fire. Is it a full choice program or is it a dual? Sure, you want to comment on it, Woody, in terms of the fine arts program at Blacklock? Yeah, and so we, have, we also have uh, Montessori. Yes. Yes, that was there. Uh, Blacklock Fine Arts Montessori. Blacklock, in terms of uh, the fine arts K to um, 5, uh, Susanna does a wonderful job with the staff there of integrating the arts into all the different uh, areas, subject areas. And uh, Montessori is, is running really well at Uplands, too, so some choices there. We also have you connect. When we're talking about um, the EDI, it shows quite clearly that um, of our nine neighborhoods, that this particular neighborhood is our lowest income. It has more people commuting out than any other area, which means there's not as much time for parents to get their kids where they need to go. Um, also, more single parent homes, less English, less access to choice, less education. And all the research on choice education says that choice favors a particular socioeconomic class. And so, I chose Nickel Mackle because I know that the city is enhancing the Nickel Mackle River District and it's going to be very beautiful. Um, I do like the idea of looking at an integrated joint program or something where Dougie Park and Blacklock and we we do incorporate it so I do understand the governance piece that Trustee Dykeman pointed out um, I just want a preliminary report but perhaps what I'm looking for is just some outdoor integration um, within those schools Great. Megan do you have any suggestions for how I can yeah. get there I think I think for sure that we have um, 
this on the radar. We've had a really great debate, and I, what I didn't hear tonight was anybody being concerned about, you know, the idea of improving education for students. I think the concern lies more with the motion. So what I'm wondering um, is uh, if the, you know, we've heard it. We don't. We don't need a motion to refer it. We we could take it to that next education. Um, meeting or if that one's too full the one after to have a more um, in-depth discussion about kind of your intent and then perhaps add it to our SD 35 uh, city liaison upcoming meeting just to have a preliminary conversation because staff attend all of those with us on on yeah. your ideas related to the city's integration um, if this motion's not passed tonight so can I ask a question mm -hmm. um, would it come back to education committee then? Would we bring? I think I think that would be the the best place for yeah. that to oh. sit. Um, but uh, the superintendent might have a better idea. Maybe there's something already in the works which it would fit better. Well, in. and I just uh, Don being here tonight is helpful. I would I think if you want to have a robust conversation, it's a little tougher here on a presentation basis. Of sometimes you get twenty or thirty minutes. Okay. Um, but we could. I would be looking at. We've got a lot of learning that we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. I think the conversation with our, the city liaison yeah. is a great spot yeah. to start. But I can maybe leave uh, with Dawn as a takeaway is in the new year, because we've set stuff up for our next strategic plan meeting. But in the new year, we pick one of those, and we bring some staff out and say, hey, here's some of the things that are underway right across the board, the James Hills and everyone else. And maybe we, and we can also give some focus to that region. That uh, would, be, would be fine. So. Great. So uh, if I strike open, so we'll make sure that you send an email tonight for that. We'll start with um, our SD35. Um, city and then the superintendent who's making a note right now will ensure that the next steps are taken Okay, so the mover is the motion is moved and seconded. So we Can need I just defeat my own motion uh, You're allowed to <laughs> we're allowed to vote. So um, all those in favor All those opposed Motion is defeated. Thank you um, for bringing the conversation though forward Vice Chair Coburn. It was an excellent conversation So we are now on to trustee comments. Um, so I will Oh I wrote that in there, but I wrote around it with my speakers list. It was so long, I wrote over it. Okay, thank you. So we are on 8.3, which was correspondence that was on our consent agenda with uh, Trustee Todd's pulled down, which is a letter which came in from MLA um, Todd Stone. So I'm going to hand this to Trustee Todd to speak to. Thank you, Chair. So uh, we all received a letter uh, basically asking, Dear Chairperson, Board of Education, uh, and uh, Todd Sohn, the MLA for Kamloops, as, as evidenced, uh, I believe even today, BCSTA was uh, in the news. Uh, Stephanie Higgin, is that? Yes, the BCSTA president. Yeah. She's the president, and she talked about the concern of, of vaping and vaping in our schools. And um, basically, the BCSTA called upon the federal government and the provincial government to act and uh, Todd Stone uh, did send us a letter basically talking about a new school year has begun and almost daily he's hearing about what's happening in, in Kamloops High School. I'm also hearing from our high schools. It's become an oversight issue. It's, it's something that's um, in many of the high schools and it happens in the, in, in the bathrooms, it happens on buses, it, it happens in, in many places that you, you wouldn't go and it, it, it's it's so easy to do and it, it's hard to trace. So um, I was hoping, he introduced a private member's bill in the PC legislature and he's basically uh, reaching out for support. Um, I don't know if I need to make a motion for this or it's a kind ask that we do reply to his letter and, and indicate some kind of support for um, what he's, he's taken on and certainly perhaps offer to work with him um, in our advocacy role uh, when it comes to um, dealing with the effects of, of, of vaping in the, the educational settings. Thank you, uh, Trustee Todd. So we'll just get a little bit of an idea where the uh, rest of the board's sitting. I'll share the motion that was passed at Provincial Council that came out in disposition of motions today to trustees, and then we can go from there whether there's a motion. If you would like um, a letter sent on behalf of the Board of Education, then we should have a motion directing the chair to write it. So um, the uh, first speaker on the list is Trustee Ross. 
Yeah, I was just going to support a motion, so I was going to make a motion. Okay, so uh, you've got a motion already written there uh, from the provincial council. Uh, the motion, uh, what uh, the letter says, <laughs> it sort of goes on for a while. Um, it would be appreciated if uh, we wrote a letter to Minister Adrian Dix urging him to take action on the issue of vaping. So if you would like to move a motion that the Langley Board of Education request uh, the chair to write a letter to Minister Adrian Dix urging the government to take action on vaping. I said it very well. You did. So that would be moved. We would then need a seconder. Seconded by Trustee Perot. So we'll go back to Trustee Ross and then please let me know if you'd like to be on the speaker's list. Yeah, I have no other comment. I think it's a, it's a, it's a problem. We need to get out in front of it instead of be behind the game. So I think it's a good start anyway. So I, I fully supportive of this. Thank you for bringing it to our attention. I, Thank you. So you should get the credit, not me. No. So trust, trust your word. Yeah, I, I'm fully in support of trying to reduce vaping. I think it's an issue across the board and, and it is quite, lack of better words, sneaky. Uh, it doesn't have that same kind of residual unless you have candy cane flavor or something like that. Which, uh, But um, I just don't know to what effect like uh, this, this will do if we have a, a provincial element to it I mean I just I would love to see what we could do within our schools especially in high schools like my daughters my kids have commented on, on it and it's, it seems to be more prevalent in some schools and there seems to be more of an appetite to tolerate it which disappoints me but um, I know in the old days there was the, uh, the the smoke hole which of course now you can't which I understand but then we would pushed them off the grounds into the into the in the park so there's all this this whole thing but clearly I want to support any effort to reduce it. I just don't want to support efforts that would just m maybe be empty. I don't know which one this is. Just help help me out. So, um, Superintendent, is there um, any sort of update you can give about just related to our schools for uh, Trustee Ward, or is that something that could come back at a later date if you don't have that information? No, I mean, we've got a principal here tonight from secondary school, uh, John Pusick, and, I, and all secondary schools don't tolerate vaping. I mean, it's not tolerated. It's 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 taken if a student uh, has that in, in their possession. Uh, we contact parents. We do all those steps. You're right. Kids go off school grounds and can do all kinds of things, and, and I'm, we're limited within the scope of our duties what we can do about that. Um, is it difficult? Yeah, you, you can have kids put themselves in places and, and, and sneak around as, as they've done with smoking in the past and other things. I think it is a real issue, no question. I'm very concerned about it. But I would want you to know that in terms of schools, that the, there's no tolerance for it. There's a lot of education around the fact that there's you know, some real harm around uh, going down this road. But, um, but, but still, there is an appeal to it. And you've got stores that are a block from school grounds that are selling these. Like, so provincially, it could help. It could maybe help with those types of things also. But I, yeah, I, want, I don't want to have the public with any impression that this is in any way tolerated at, at, at the schools. I just want to make sure I'm clear on that. That's all. I have uh, Vice Chair Coburn and then Trustee Todd. Yeah. Okay, so the motion that we are speaking to tonight would be that it's been moved and seconded that the Langley Board of Education request a uh, chairperson to write a letter to Minister Adrian Dix urging him to take action on the issue of vaping. Okay, um, so the last speaker I have on the list uh, before I'll just read the motion that we had at BCST because I'll, I'll incorporate that in as Trustee Todd and then uh, and then we'll go back to Trustee or Vice Chair Coburn. So Trustee Todd. So yeah, thank you. Uh, the reason why it's Minister Adrian Dix is he's the Minister of Health and um, if uh, memory serves me correct, uh, the Minister of Health in the late 70s was somebody called Jacob. And he was actually my MP and he became Minister of Health and he identified uh, smoking as a, the number one public health issue. And uh, probably no minister, a federal minister of health has done more for actually um, addressing the issue of smoking head on. And it, 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 he adulted a, adopted a multi-pronged approach, which much of it was around education. It was also around price point, And it also began some of the stuff around what uh, packaging looked like. And, and yes, it's late. I, I feel that we've, We've maybe missed this. We knew it was coming, and it's happened. But now we need to kind of respond, uh, and, and, you know, unfortunately. So I, I 
appreciate that. I appreciate the, the words of support. I appreciate the, the things. And um, I, I think it's just, it, it's time to act on this. So thank you. Or thank you, Trustee Chat. So our last speaker is Vice Chair Coburn. Super chatty. Um, so after we like hearing the motion because Trustee Ward had some concerns, I, I am very supportive of writing to the provincial government, especially like precisely for the reason that you pointed out is the Minister of Health. And so if he has boards writing to him collectively that says do something about this, not just in the schools, just do something about this, that's a lot of political pressure um, for um, a minister to deal with. And additionally, um, I myself know that if you make something flavored, kids will smoke it. And they banned flavored cigarettes and everybody laughed and said that wouldn't do anything. But I can tell you as somebody who did smoke as a younger girl, um, we liked flavored cigarettes and a lot of people quit smoking and we should be taking flavors away. And I have a lot of young people in my house and they just don't see it as dangerous. They would be sitting in my house vaping and I say to them, would you light a cigarette in my home? And they're like, no, it's vaping. I said, it's worse. So it is this very laissez-faire attitude. How can it be bad? It's cotton candy. Um, so if nothing else, we could get our government moving on things like no flavors. Like if you want your nicotine, get your nicotine. It doesn't need to taste like cotton candy. So I am super supportive of advocating. Thank you. Thank you. So um, what the motion that came forward to provincial council, uh, which was moved by um, SD 58, uh, so the, the, it was that the BCSTA urge the ministries of health, BC and Canada, so federally and provincially, the Ministry of Education and health authorities to firstly to make resources for youth on vape health and implications and vape cessation widely available, and then secondly to revise current resources and services for smoking cessation to specifically include vaping in youth. So those were the two actions that came there. Um, so when I write the letter, I could include, you know, our provincial association has, has requested this also, and we'd like to see you take some action to help our youth. So I will, um, if this passes, I'll, I'll write a letter and distribute it to all trustees. Okay, so that has been moved and seconded. So uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? The motion's carried unanimously. Thank you. Trustee Todd and everybody who, who supported this. So I will make sure that's done. Okay, so now we get to move to item nine, which is trustee comments. So I will start on my far right, trustee word. Last time I, I started with trustee Wilson, I'm pretty sure. Restless. Uh, I don't have a lot to say. I think we had a really good discussion tonight. Thank everybody for attending and being a partner with us and for those who have been online listening and our staff and fellow board members for your collegial support tonight. And it's been an enjoyable meeting. Have a good evening. Trustee Coburn, Vice Chair. Um, first, I'd just like to thank my colleagues at the table for um, approving that Naloxone motion. It um, really uh, means a lot to me. So I really appreciate it. Um, I just would like to quickly um, report out. Um, in September, I attended the UBCM conference, which is the Union of BC Municipalities. It was my very first time attending this conference, and um, I could very much see the value. I did attend a lot of very useful workshops and sessions, like what does reconciliation look like in your community, um, childcare, integrated communities, um, and what I found to be really uh, interesting <laughs> was that every single government person minister you name it was there um, and that was pretty amazing because you had access to different types of ministries because our our issues are quite multi ministerial um, and it made me wonder why trustees don't get that kind of connection um, as we schools are a place where mental health um, health physical health uh, every everything you could imagine sustainability runs through our schools um, so it was kind of very interesting to me that why education is never at that table yet education is expected to deal with everybody else's decisions that they make at their table um, and this becomes wholly problematic especially around child care spaces so you have to have this many child care spaces who's going to do it and the municipalities aren't talking to the school districts because they don't get invited to the table 
Um, so I did find that very useful, and I'm hoping that we could find a way to work with our organization to try and bring more ministers to our meetings. Um, and yeah, I just, I just realized that we need a far more visible presence at the table, and uh, the benefit was the networking, and then I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight. And did I steal your update? <laughs>